I'm Neil Crooks, I'm uh, from the UK, and I'm going to do a quick talk for you guys about uh, designing some Cake PHP plugins for consuming APIs. Okay, so the contents of the talk, we're going to be covering um, a little bit of uh, stuff for foundations initially, so a bit about Cake PHP plugins in general, APIs, um, and then going to talk about REST as the, as the main example. Um, REST obviously uh, uses HTTP, so a quick uh, overview of that, and then also how we're going to be making those calls in Cake, i.e. using the Cake PHP HTTP socket, and also uh, a quick um, chat about OAuth as well, because a lot of the APIs out there uh, require authentication, and, and OAuth is the best way of authenticating, and it's what a lot of people, a lot of uh, APIs use. So then we're going to move on to having a quick look at the design approach that uh, is like the, the main focus of the talk. Uh, a quick overview of the traditional approach, some issues that, that I have with that, and then a quick chat about my solution that I've uh, come up with. And finally, we're going to have um, a few quick examples. Okay, so quickly, first of all, I reckon there's about four types of Cake PHP plugins. There's like the mini apps that you get that uh, they provide the full functionality that you can include in your app, like a blog or a store, lo uh, excuse me, store locator or something like that. Then you've got like uh, extenders type of plugins. They extend your app with more functionality. Cake DC have released the commentable and taggable plugins out there. Uh, which I think extend like your you might have like a blog post um, model and you can extend that with your commentable and taggable behaviors. Um, then enhancers, so they uh, don't actually add any like new functionality to your users from a you know a, a data perspective, but uh, they enhance your existing application, um, uh, your existing functionality, such as like a filter component or something like that. And then finally, um, plugins that I call wrappers, and they basically, you know, an example of that is they provide functionality to access third-party APIs. And it's that last type of plugin that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, moving on, quickly uh, mentioning uh, something about APIs. Um, I don't know if you can see that graphic, but it's taken from Programmable Web, which is the website that documents um, loads and loads of APIs that are, that are out there. Uh, and the big, huge, green section is REST APIs. That's the protocol used by 73% of the APIs that uh, Programmable Web uh, details. So, um, yeah, they're RESTful. Uh, and my work that I've been doing recently has been mainly consuming these RESTful APIs. So for this presentation and the examples, that's what I'm going to focus on. But the concepts illustrated in this design approach that I will come on to later, they can really be applied to any protocol. So, um, you know, if you've got a, uh, like, consumer, a SOAP API or XML RPC or anything like that, you can still use these concepts. So, because we're going to focus on REST, just a very quick introduction to REST. So, it stands for Representational State Transfer, which doesn't really mean all that much, but the largest known implementation of a system conforming to the REST architectural style is, anybody? The internet, exactly, the World Wide Web. It's basically a, a REST architecture. It's, it, it involves clients and servers just communicating over HTTP. Uh, REST uses or exploits the existing HTTP verbs like get and post, so you don't need to um, like write, write your own or create your own um, like ontology or anything like that. So, like in SOAP, for example, you would have to write a method called like get users and then you know call that and everything. Whereas with REST, it's it's all using existing um, terminology and existing technology. And essentially, all it does is it just acts on a resource, and a resource is a URI. Um, so you get a URI or you post data to a URI over HTTP. Quick, quick overview of HTTP. So you send the request, you've got the HTTP verb at the start, you send that to a URI and then it's the protocol um, version uh, uh, afterwards. 
Then you've got optional header lines, which is like the name, colon, and then a value. Then a, a line break, and you've got an optional body. And this is all just plain text that, uh, that is being sent through a socket. Uh, and so if you send a request like that, you're essentially, or well, you're hopefully going to get some kind of a response, which looks like protocol name, a status code like 200 or 404 or something like that, and a message, and then some optional headers, and then an optional body. A uh, quick example, uh, so get example.com slash index, and send a user agent header as well, and your response is going to be the protocol name and, you know, 200 OK, and content type headers and content length, and then the body is, is beneath that. So, as you can see, essentially it's just, you open a socket, um, and then you just send plain text down that socket, and then you wait for a response from the, uh, from the server. Here's a very quick example with a, with a post request and response. Um, as you can see, it's just an example, like posting to, to login. Content type is this specific one here, application uh, form URL encoded, and then you pass the, the, the body is like a name value pairs separated by ampersands, and you get a, a response that looks something like that, maybe. Okay, so in Cake, we can communicate via REST using the, uh, the cause excellent HTTP socket class. Has anybody uh, used that a lot extensively? Yeah, cool. It's excellent, isn't it? It, uh, it makes life so, so simple and uh, handles all the complexities for you. Uh, the usage is very straightforward. You basically import it uh, like that and then uh, create a new uh, object and then you call the request method on that object and you send it an array. And that array has keys for things like the method that you want to use, the URI that you're going to be getting or posting, and then uh, things like um, you know, optional sections for the body and things like that. And you can have a look at the request property of the HTTP socket class in the core to have a look and see what all the other keys are. So, uh, what does HTTP socket do? It, like I said, it, it's really good. It handles the creating, the writing to, and the reading from sockets. Uh, it extends cake socket, which is another core class. So it, it handles all things like escaping and encoding, uh, and all you've got to do is just send it, send it an array. And then the response that, it, that you get back from the server, it passes that response out. So you can get access to you know, the specific status codes and the body and it even handles cookies and stuff like that that are set by the server. The other thing that, that the HTTP socket can do, uh, the class can do in the core at the moment is handle basic authentication. Um, and that is where your host name is prefixed by your username, colon, password, and then an at symbol. And that, um, that is it's an example shown on the uh, on the on the uh, cookbook for the uh, Twitter data source that's on there. Um, but obviously, unfortunately, as you may know, Twitter stopped allowing basic authentication uh, to their API like in the last couple of days or so. And so, your only option now is OAuth. Uh, OAuth. Um, Sorry if you can't if you can't read that. Basically, I've been very verbose in the in the slides because I wanted to just put it up on SlideShare so you guys don't have to remember everything that uh, I've got up here, and there uh, you can just read it all and get get a, all the information that you need from the slides. So I'll put them on SlideShare after the presentation. So in summary, uh, what OAuth does is um, it allows users of a service like Twitter or or Google APIs or something like that to authorize other parties, like your application, to access um, the accounts of that user on that service without actually telling you, your application, their password. So it's really secure. Um, and you know, the user has like, total control over uh, what, um, you know, whether they want to like, uh, revoke access to your application at any time or, or anything like that. They don't have to change their password with Twitter, uh, you know, to stop you having access to their account on Twitter and stuff like that. So, um, 
It's and you know it, it's definitely like the the future of authentication for, uh, for APIs and lots of other things. Um, so that's what it does in summary. In reality, it, you have to do a bit of handshaking between your application and the service provider to get some strings, uh, get some tokens. Sorry, that are strings. That you then redirect the user off to that service to uh, um, uh, get them to allow access to your account uh, to get them to allow uh, yeah, access to your application, sorry. And then finally, you get a, an access token back, which you can either just keep in the session and only use it for that session, or you can save it in the database or persist it in some other way so that you can um, use that again and, and reconnect uh, to that user's account on that, on that API later on. Uh, and in practice, all it is is an extra header line in the HTTP request that you make. It's the authorization header. Uh, and in that, in that line, there's some parameters like a timestamp and things like that. And then there's also a token that identifies your application to the API provider. And then there's a, uh, a signature string that signs the request. And it's a hash of various other request parameters. And uh, it's hashed up with some secret tokens. <laughs> that sounds, sounds a lot more exciting than it is. <laughs> Um, and like I said earlier, it's used by Twitter and the Google APIs. Uh, a version of, of OAuth is also used by Facebook as well. Um, but it's OAuth 2.0, and uh, what I'm talking about here is really just OAuth 1.0. Okay, um, so it sounds fairly complicated, but um, uh, the, AP, the examples and uh, the plugins that I'll show you a bit later, the Twitter and the uh, and, uh, one for G data, they both use OAuth. And um, w I, to, to simplify uh, using OAuth with these APIs, I created um, an extension to the Kate Core HTTP socket, um, which allows you to just add some additional um, parameters into the request array that you're going to send to the HTTP socket request method. And, all it, and, and then this HTTP so socket OAuth class uh, creates that signature string for you and handles all of the, the hashing and everything like that. So uh, that's available on GitHub. And uh, you can check that out if you want to use OAuth. OK, so that's um, covering the foundations. OK, so let's have a quick look at the, what this talk's all about and the design approach. So the traditional approach to um, writing some code that interacts with these APIs is to create a data source. Um, it's kind of like the approach that's advocated on the, uh, in the cookbook with the, um, the data source, uh, the Twitter data source that's on there. Uh, and you know, everybody, and their, everybody and their dog writes these data sources for accessing these, uh, these APIs. And they tend to be fairly complex uh, and contain all the logic for accessing the uh, methods on these, data, on these APIs. And sometimes people advocate that you call the methods on the data source directly from your models or controllers or wherever you want. Um, or, you know, as implied by the Twitter data source in the cookbook, if you've seen that, you do actually access the uh, methods through your models, but most of the logic is in the data source. And this works really well for simple stuff because, you know, the the Twitter data source on the on the cookbook, you know, it you can create a tweet and you can show all the tweets that I uh, that a particular user has created. But um, you know, and that's the way that I started doing it as well. But what I found is that that re that approach didn't really scale well. Like for example, Twitter's got over a hundred API calls available, and all of them have got absolutely tons and tons of options and parameters and, and things like that. And the one on the cookbook, it only implements two of them, as I said, and it partially implements them, not fully, and it's already at 86 lines. If you scale that up, you're going to end up with a data source class that's like, you know, five or 6,000 lines long, I think, which I don't really like the idea of that. And also, by, you know, having all that logic in there, um, we're not able to exploit any of Cake's built-in goodness, like model callbacks and validation and pagination. 
The other, the example in the in the cookbook as well, it also says, uh, or it includes like the schema in the data source, and that means that um, it's difficult to have you know lots of models using that one data source. And it just didn't feel right to me to access these, these methods from the data source. I think, um, you know, nowhere else really in, a, in your Cake application do you often access the data source directly. It's pretty much always you access the data source through your model state. So what did feel right? Well, I thought about what operations you're actually doing on these APIs. You're, you're reading data, you're creating and updating data, and you're deleting data, basically. That's what all of them allow you to do. Uh, I.e., you're finding, you're saving, and you're deleting. So what type of classes in Cake PHP provide these methods already? Anybody? Models, yay, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Models, yay. <laughs> That's right, they, they are skinny models, but what should models be? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, they should be fat. But, oh man, I looked, I looked for an image for fat models and fat ladies and it just wasn't appropriate. So. <laughs> this is a flower, I think it is, and it's supposed to look like this. This is the one that came up for fat lady. <laughs> so uh, if we move our API calls into like model find and model save and model delete methods, this feels like the right place to me. And, um, you know, everybody is familiar with interacting with those methods. Everybody calls model find or, or whatever and save, don't you, in your applications? And so what you can do is you can have lots of these, like, really simple model classes um, to achieve the scale and the separation of concerns that I was worried about earlier. And, uh, each model, you can have like um, you know, you can have different validation rules in them, and you can have each can have their own schemas. So that if you're in your application, are uh, going to like create a form to create a tweet or to upload a YouTube video or something like that, then um, you can use Cake's built-in form helper to do it all, and it will you know render out all the right field types for according to the schema that you set up in these models, and have validation rules for them all as well. But what about this cake PHP goodness that we talked about? Uh, well, some of it, like triggering the callback. So if, we've, if you imagine that you've moved your logic to, for creating a tweet, for example, into like the model save method for, or like the, for the, in your Twitter status model, um, you know, what, you know to, to handle like the triggering of all the callbacks that we're normally used to, um, we'd have to trigger them all manually which you know, isn't really that nice. And the same with validation as well. Um, you know, the handling of custom find types. If you look in the model cake cores uh, model um, class, the, uh, the find method in there handles like all the custom find types that I think uh, was covered in the, in the workshop earlier, this, uh, this conference. Um, so if we made these API calls directly in these methods and return the responses from them, to exploit all the built-in functionality, we'd have to trigger it all manually, which obviously means like duplicating loads and loads of code from Cape Core model class. Uh, it's not very dry, and we don't like... We like wet stuff, I think, don't we? Not dry stuff. No, we like dry stuff, I mean. Not wet stuff, it's wet. <laughs> so, OK, so how are we going to fix this? How are we going to... Um, mean that we don't have to repeat all of this code and yet we can still get all of this lovely cake goodness. So to understand it, we've got to have a quick look in the, in the model internals. So the methods, they, they accept uh, various parameters such as conditions uh, and data to save, etc. And then in like the model find method, if you've, if you've looked, it checks for like custom find types and stuff. Uh, and then uh, in the save method, it does uh, you know, your validation checks. Then it triggers your before callbacks. Then in the model find, it actually calls the create method. Uh, sorry, in the model find, it calls the read method in the data source that that model's 
use DB config property is set to. Um, and then, you know, for, for save, you know, I think uh, Ichi mentioned it earlier, didn't he, in the, this talk about MongoDB. Um, you know, the, the model find, save, and delete methods map to the create, read, update, and delete methods on, the, on your data source. And then it triggers the after callbacks. And then it returns the result. So, so my solution that I, um, you know, it's, it's probably glaringly obvious to everybody, but it wasn't to me at the time, um, was you create these plugins, and uh, the plugins, they've got one model for each type of resource in the API. So you have a model for Twitter status or like a model for YouTube video. The model implements the find, or actually more commonly just like KPHP's custom find types, um, and the save and delete methods as appropriate. And then these methods, they set the details of the request, a, the array that represents the HTTP request, the HTTP socket request method expects, as we saw earlier, in, uh, in the request property of your model. And then you call the same method on the parent object. So basically, I'll show you an example of this later, but you, you basically got, um, like a, a method in your Twitter status model called save. Actually, I think it's shown on the next slide. Uh, oh, no. You've got a, a method in, the, in your Twitter status model called save. Uh, you have a request property of that Twitter status model, and you're creating like an array in there that the HTTP socket class expects, and that's all. You're not actually issuing the request. And then you call parent save which passes it off to, to, the, to the actual, you know, Kate Core's model. So then Kate PHP's model class handles the validation for you and all the custom find types and triggers the callbacks, etc. And then it calls the create, read, update, and delete on your data source and passes it that model object. So you then have a data source in your plugin that is really, really simple. And all it does is issue the request defined by the array in the model's request property. And it issues the request, and then it just simply returns that result. Mm, you know, sounds maybe a little bit complicated, but it's, it's really not. And I'll show you uh, some examples in a second. Um, I've also written a, a REST data source that is really easy to use and extend, and that handles the issuing of the request and uh, the decoding of the response and things like that. And um, you can uh, use that in your, uh, in your RESTful, um, in your plugins that consume RESTful APIs. Or um, you can extend it or, or something like that as well. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a very quick example. So let's assume that we've got our, our data source set up already. Um, this is an example of like a, the Twitter status model I was talking about. So it implements the save method. It accepts some data. And all we're doing here is we're setting up the, um, the request property in our model. And then at the bottom there, we're calling go uh, parent save. And you can call that anywhere in your application in this would be one line of code if... <laughs> Uh, if, it, if it was long enough, but uh, yeah, you can just literally, in one line of code, you can create a tweet from anywhere. Um, you can do it in your after save method of like your post model, for example. So if you're creating a new post on your, uh, on your website and you want to automatically tweet about it, you can just uh, use this line of code in here and in the after save method of that. Uh, I mentioned the uh, REST data source that I wrote that you can extend or, or use in your plugin. There's some information about it there. Um, like I say, these slides will be up on SlideShare afterwards, so you can uh, you don't need to write that down or anything. Okay. Um, so yeah, you just in in your in the models that you're creating to access these APIs, you just set the use DB config parameter to that data source, uh, and then you can um, like. For example, you can just use that REST source in your plugins, or you can extend it and override the, 
request method in, or you, if you look in there, there's a request method that actually handles the issuing of the request. But what I do in, in quite a few of the plugins that I've written is just override that and add like the common um, keys to that request property. So if like you've got a plugin for Twitter, like pretty much every request that you make to Twitter's API, the host of that is like api.twitter.com. And so you can abstract all of that out and put it into, uh, into the data source. So you don't need to define it every, um, every time in each of your model methods. Okay, um, apologies if you can't see this very well. Um, it is available on Google Docs, but it's a diagram that illustrates the flow through the, the methods um, and classes involved in like creating a tweet, for example. So the top line is kind of like uh, your post controller or your post model or whatever, and it's just doing that class registry in it um, uh, and loading up the Twitter status model and calling the save method on it. That save method in your Twitter status model, as I said earlier, sets the request property and then calls parent save. Um, Cake's core model is the, the class that that, that that Twitter status model extends. So in there, that handles the validation and then calls data source create. Um, in the Twitter plugin that I'll show you later, there is a Twitter data source, but uh, it doesn't implement the create method. Um, so that defaults back to the REST data source that, uh, uh, that the data source in the Twitter plugin extends. Um, and sets like the method of the request to post, and that's it. And then it calls the request method, which handles adding in the authentication parameters. And then we actually, oh, what's going on there? <laughs> uh, and then it ends up um, like issuing the request from the uh, the REST source, which uh, then goes through the HTTP socket. OAuth class to add the signature to the request, and then that passes off to the HTTP socket class, which actually handles creating the socket and writing the, uh, sending the request data and, and passing the response. And then, so there's a lot of stuff going on there, but it, what you have is the, you, you've basically got a really powerful, um, a lot of powerful functionality that's accessible through in, in like one line of code at this thing at the top here. So just calling a single method on your, on your model, like save or find. So in summary, like by designing the plugins like this, you're providing uh, simple one line method calls to API functions. Uh, they're familiar to everybody. You know, everybody knows how to use like model find or model save. Uh, it's easy to document them as well because you've got um, it, you know, this separation of concerns and you've got single methods doing specific things on, on the APIs. You also get to exploit all the cake PHP goodness, such as the validation and the callbacks. And um, you can have lots of models, one for each resource type on the API, each with its own schema, as I said earlier, which the form helper uses, and um, their own validation rules. So let's have a look at a couple of quick examples. Uh, let's let's go and do this on here. So earlier today, um, I put up two plugins on my GitHub account. Uh, one for uh, GData, and in there there are there's um, some code that implements some of the YouTube API and also some of the Google Analytics API, and um, also one for Twitter as well. So. What I thought I would do first is just uh, show you um, how some of them work. So in the plugin for GData, there is like an auth component in there which helps you, handles all of the authentication and stuff with Google. Um, <laughs> Shall I put that one in comedy? 
<laughs> okay, now if everybody could stop using the internet right now, that would be great. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. So what, what's happening here is, uh, earlier today I just I downloaded a fresh Cake 1.33 um, zip file, got it running locally, uh, got the plugin in there, and um, uh, all I need, all you need to do is just add a, a developer key into the config file um, in the plugin, and then basically you've got um, access to quite a few of the functions on the YouTube API. This is like about a 10 meg, like probably about 10 minute video as well. So, it's gonna <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's happening here is I've uploaded it to like my local host here, and then um, <laughs> sorry, I've already clipped up like great. Ah, <laughs> oh, you shit. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did this earlier, hold on. And it, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's there, it's just it's uh, YouTube's processing it. I think it I think it'll be okay. <laughs> okay, so while YouTube's processing that <laughs> Uh, I thought I'd also show you um, some features of the of the Twitter plugin as well. So uh, let's connect with Twitter. Okay, so basically uh, the Twitter plugin that I've written, um, imp well, it's it's implementing a fair amount of the API, but not all of it. But this, for example, is like my home screen. So here we go, Josh Holmes. Ah, oh, crap. That's right. <laughs> so that, that's like all the people I follow in there and their, their tweets. Like as if I'd gone to Twitter.com and, and signed in. Um, so yeah, it's you can you know see mentions and stuff like that. It implements the mentions, API calls, the retweets of me, to me, by me, everything like that. Uh, you can create a tweet on there as well, so I hope this one works. <coughs> ah! Alright, I'll sort that one out. Okay, let's try... Uh, included in the Twitter plugin is a uh, the ability to upload a Twitter pic as well. So let's give this a go. Uh, I haven't got any of you dancing, Gabriel, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm looking for a particular one. Hold on. Where is it? This is... These plugins are a work in progress. <laughs> uh, how do we? Yeah, hey, there we go. So that one worked. <laughs> let's let's have a look and see if if this one's ready yet. <sighs> Yay! I went and show you now. I went and show everybody now, Gabriel. They can all youtube.com slash Neil Crooks. You can see it on there. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Just coming 
<laughs> okay, so here we go. Sorry, I'll stand back. Um, these two here are the um, plugins I've just been talking about. So there's a GData plugin, and then there's a Twitter API plugin, and uh, you can go on there and have a look. And, and basically, it, uh, you know, these, these kind of plugins, they're really easy for you to use and integrate into your application. All the methods, all the functionality in that is in model methods that you can just uh, use in, you know, wherever you want in your own application. Um, uh, they're, they're all kind of like following the same kind of approach. Uh, I've also put one up here for uh, the, like Bitly there, which creates Bitly links for you and things like that. And then there's a Yahoo GeoPlanet one as well, which allows you to build things like store locators and stuff. And um, basically what I wanted to do was just like share with you guys um, a bit about the approach. Um, and so I, th I think it's just like it's a really simple, neat, tidy way of accessing these APIs. And you can, you know, make use of all Cake's excellent functionality as well. And if you're going to write a plugin to you or if you need to consume a RESTful API in your application, I'd encourage you to have a look at some of these plugins. And, um, you know, if you like the, the way that I've done it as well, then um, give it a go that way yourself and then share it back with the community. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. We can either stop there and have any questions, or I can uh, show you a little bit more about um, what's going on under the hood in some of these plugins. Savant, yeah? Do you have any of the other videos? <laughs> <laughs> this one was. Uh, Supplied by, by Gary, so I haven't got any now. Can you show us the uh, delete function of the <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I know it's not implemented yet. <laughs> but it sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I've used these, um, you know, some of these functions in production sites, so. Some of them, you know, are, are fairly robust and rock solid. Like uh, built like um, white label like video upload site, like competition site and stuff using that YouTube. Uh, using you, you know, so the site allows anybody to upload a video themselves, and they enter a competition for, our, um, you know, and the client that we build it for gets to pick a winner and things. And the, you know, those kind of things are are great for your clients to just like get user generated content and stuff because everybody. Everybody likes making a twat of themselves on video and sharing it with their friends. So, um, is there any other questions at all? I'll just show you very briefly, I'm particularly proud of this particular, the, the, uh, the YouTube upload method. It's an absolute bitch to, to do. Uh, where is it? So here's the save method. So you can literally just go class registry in it, gdata dot YouTube video save, and then you pass it an array, just like you would normally do. Like, you know, send it a, a normal cake array or a normal array to like cake model save, uh, and you can pass it. You know, you've got keys for like title and description and stuff like that, and then you've got a file key here which contains the, the name of the video and the mind type and like the actual location of where it is on your server and things like that. So in one line there you can upload a YouTube video, which is I think I think it's pretty cool. So this particular method like you have to uh, create like a, a multi part HTTP request. So I've been like balls deep in <laughs> HTTP specs and things like that and OAuth documentation. But um yeah, so we create like an XML document containing all the metadata for the video, uh, and then we start building up the body of our request here. So we create like the the, the boundary string for the HTTP multi-part request. Uh, so then we do like content type, and this, then send the actual XML. Then there's another boundary, 
and then content type is the actual mime type of the video and then we're sending binary data for the video and then just go for file get contents on the actual file. And then here's that request array like I talked about earlier, uh, the request property of this model. So we set the URI host and path, so it's going to upload .gdata.youtube.com and a path there and we send some extra headers. We specify our auth method to be OAuth and then the actual data source for this uh, plugin, it adds in the OAuth um, parameters that I talked about earlier and then sends the body and then just calls or, or uh, adds the body into the array and then calls parent save. And uh, then the data source and HTTP socket class and the OAuth uh, extension to that will kick in and, and handle the actual request. So video, Gary C. Gary is sending me the video. Another video. That's it. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, it, you know, the, like I said, it's like uploading a video to YouTube is fairly complex, especially, you know, when you're doing it with OAuth authentication as well. Um, and you can just do it in one line of code in your application. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, is, is there any other questions? Has so anybody got any like projects coming up that you know you're going to have the consumer RESTful API on? Yeah, like like what what, what APIs are you going to use? I've got one that's going to be coming up with a payment processor. Okay. Okay, cool. Is it literally just like one method on there, like process or something like that? Or uh, is it's it? one URL within method calls that are, I mean, something yeah. how this stuff is, so it should fit pretty well with this. It'd be awesome if you could, you know, create a plugin, put it, you know, give it back to the community as well, and uh, yeah, it'd be cool. Josh? Um, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, is it like RDF stuff, is that right? It's, it's RESTful with uh, referenceability, so it's, it's got uh, manifests and such that you can get, but it's, it's RESTful with API interaction. Okay. So I'm just, just curious. No, I haven't, sorry. Okay, thanks very much, guys. <laughs>